standing on top of level four of the Green Bank Telescope, the largest fully steerable radio telescope in the world. We're standing directly under the reflector for the main structure, which is 2.4 acres in size. Radio astronomy started back in the 1920s and 30s. It really got its start when people were surveying the radio sky to understand noise that they were seeing within their own radio observations. And they began to realize that that radio noise was actually coming from outer space, from the sun, from the stars, and from the distant galaxies that we see out there. And so with that became the field of radio astronomy, and that, that grew and grew until eventually in the 1950s, 1956, the United States realized that if we were going to be a player in this new field of, of science, we needed to build a national radio astronomy facility. When they decided to, to build a national radio astronomy facility, they began looking around the country to determine where the best site would, for, for that facility would be. And they had a lot of different criteria in that decision, but one of the biggest and possibly most important in the long run was they wanted an area where radio frequency interference was minimal. You can imagine, 1958, there were no wireless communications to speak of. But in the last 10 to 15 years, wireless technology has exploded. Everyone has a cell phone. And right. it's simply because the telescope is so sensitive that, for instance, your cell phone that you're so attached to, if it alone, that single cell phone, were placed on Mars, for instance, it would be the brightest radio object in the sky to us. So we have to figure out a way to allow communications, particularly for emergency medical purposes, and still protect the data that the observer is trying to receive. So from this point on, beyond this gate, we require that a diesel engine only travel down here and you can see the no spark plug sign. We design, build, and run these extremely technologically advanced instruments, but here on site, we can't use the technology that everyone else is used to using. We don't have cell phones, we don't have microwave ovens. There are a few people that are upset that they can't have the conveniences that maybe their aunt and uncle in you know Ohio have but again we try to find a way to work with those people to provide them what they would like to have without having the wireless be part of it When the GBT came along, it's not just very sensitive, but it has a very wide frequency range. That is, we can look at wavelengths from many, many meters down to things that are just three millimeters in wavelength, so very, very small. And with that came the idea of, well, let's just use this incredibly sensitive telescope with its incredibly wide frequency range and go see what we could find out there. So they pointed the telescope at areas where you can expect to find complex molecules, like star formation areas, and they found very, very complex molecules, more complex than anybody would have imagined, up to very basic sugars in space. So that tells us that the building blocks of life are everywhere out there. As Douglas Adams said, the universe is huge. It's mind-bogglingly huge. And, and we're already discovering stars that have other planetary systems, very much like our own Earth, here in our own galaxy. There absolutely is life out there. Uh, I, I would even go as far to say that I think there's intelligent life out there. The bigger question is, even if the universe is teeming with intelligent life, are we gonna be able to detect it in our lifetime? That's an incredibly difficult feat to do. We are, with a certain suite of instruments here right now, at least trying to reach back to milliseconds after the Big Bang occurred. And we're looking at the epic of reionization uh, when 
there started to be a coalescence of material. Once you have star creation, you have a long laundry list of things that, at least for us, end up into human creation because we're all made of the stuff that the stars produce. So it's a very interesting thing to watch. I really think there was something before the Big Bang too. I think that there may have been many Big Bangs because the logic for me is there that it occurred. Every day people here think about those possibilities, not just whether it's possible, but how do I go about proving that that's a possibility? And the instruments that are here and allow a lot of that work to be done.